Hello, everyone. Thank you all for coming, and welcome to the first of our 2020 lecture series on radio. I'm Daniel Sheen, station manager for the MIT Radio Society. Uh, before we begin, I'd just like to take a moment to talk about the club. The MIT Radio Society was founded in 1909 on MIT's Back Bay campus by a group of 35 students intent on pursuing and advancing the art of radio. Those students went on to become engineers, faculty, college administrators, even two presidents of MIT. They helped shape the amateur radio community, and they also helped shape this institution. They helped found the Radiation Laboratory and later the Research Laboratory of Electronics. Because of them, we have a lot of different technologies today. But the club's still fundamentally the same people. We're an excited group of students who enjoy learning and tinkering with radio. We spend our time playing with Earth Moon Earth communication systems, GPS, microwave circuits, and more. And we enjoy sharing that knowledge, which is why we created this series. But after 111 years, we could also use a bit of your help. Our station on the Green Building is aging. MIT is renovating the building, and we've been told that unless we can finance the renovation of our space, we won't have it anymore. So if you value what we do, if you enjoy hearing us on the air, if you want, enjoy watching these lectures, please consider helping. The details on how you can get involved and donate are, are on our website, w1mx.mit.edu. But with that, I'd like to welcome our speaker, Dr. Mark Yeary. Dr. Yeary is a professor of electrical and computer engineering at the University of Oklahoma and a co-founder of their Radar Innovations Laboratory. He has bachelor's, master's, and PhD degrees from Texas A&M. He's an IEEE fellow and a member of Tau Beta Pi and Eta Kappa Nu. His extensive research experience is focused on radar systems and digital signal processing. And he's kindly agreed to join us here today to teach us a little about that. So with that, I'd like you all to give a warm welcome to Dr. Mark Geary. <clears throat> okay. Um, thank you, Daniel. So uh, with the radio club, you know that radio, the radio spectrum can be used for communication and many other uh, uh, uses. Today, we'll be talking about the use of the RF spectrum for radar and sensing of the atmosphere to detect principally severe weather. So um, why would we do that? So as a nation, um, we have a lot of weather impact throughout the nation, particularly severe storms, uh, winter storms, hail, et cetera. And, and in fact, um, the US experiences more tornadoes than any other country, and about almost 40% of the total insured losses are because of these very destructive storms. Moreover, uh, hail, which is another version of severe storms, is also uh, very, very prevalent throughout most of the country and uh, here in the Northeast. And so where I hail from, research uh, there in Norman for severe weather, and we're also looking at other ways that uh, radar, radar and electromagnetics research can be used for other areas. And so for those that are you, of you that are sitting here in this talk, um, I'd like you to be aware that uh, radar has many connections to other areas, such as 5G communication. So as you may know, uh, 5G will be a beamformed technology very much as we envision the next generation of weather radar uh, to be beamformed as well. Uh, autonomous automotive radar, which you know is a super hot topic these days. Um, beamforming and radar technologies are associated with this. Medical imaging radar, uh, many of the MRI algorithms that you may know of rely on uh, synthetic aperture radar imaging, uh, things like this. And the list kind of goes on and on, all the way down through air traffic control, radar astronomy, um, ground penetrating radar, 
and uh, radar such as radar is used for uh, uh, monitoring soil moisture. And so to begin with, um, I think it's good to begin with Maxwell's equations and some understanding of, of scattering, and that will beginning, be the beginning part of the talk. So I see one fellow here with Maxwell's equation on his t-shirt, so uh, I think we're all in the right place. And so I begin with uh, Maxwell's equations, and I, I begin with a curl of Faraday's law, uh, as we have here. And then we arrive at uh, this kind of classic uh, isotropic uh, equation here for the uh, electromagnetic wave equation given by this expression here, where E represents the uh, electric, electric field or the magnetic field. And so what we'd like to do is we'd like to solve out this second order differential equation as I show next. And so, as we know, um, the fields are typically represented as a sum of known and unknown components. And one example of the solution of this wave equation is this, uh, um, it's for an infinite series for the perfectly conducting sphere, which we'll see next, which helps us arrive at the radar cross-section of a sphere. And so to help us arrive, that, arrive to that, we use the uh, Bessel functions, which I've uh, show here and next. And so by definition, um, the Bessel functions are the solutions to uh, this particular differential equation, and uh, they rely on functions of the first and second kind. So luckily within MATLAB, we have, uh, as I've written here, J uh, is equal to this and uh, Y is equal to that so that uh, I can arrive at a, an iterative solution at computing the um, RCS of a sphere. And so why would I do this? So as it turns out that Raindrops, hailstones, uh, small scatters of this nature can be modeled as spheres. And what we'd like to do is we'd like to be able to uh, model these as a certain scatter in the Rayleigh region, which I'll show uh, uh, later. And so by definition, this is the radar cross-section of a sphere. And as I work through the solution of this equation uh, with these expressions, then if I plot out the normalized RCS of that, then I arrive at this very classic curve that you see here, which uh, begins increasing and then goes through this period of oscillation and then asymptotes. And we say that this region in here, whereby the size of the object is much smaller than the uh, wavelength that's illuminating it, we call it the Rayleigh region. On the other hand, in this region here, when the size of the object is much larger than the illuminating wavelength, wavelength say for instance, uh, we have an airplane flying by and we're illuminating it with a S-band radar, say 10 centimeters, uh, that's very much in the optical region. But for today's discussion, we're very much interested in this Rayleigh region, whereby this is the region that these volumetric scatterers uh, dominate. Uh, rain, snow, hail, fog, dust, etc. And so for the typical weather radar, it turns out that those radars operate in the uh, S-band. So if you'll take that as, for instance, three gigahertz uh, or 10 centimeter wavelength, the Rayleigh region is where these uh, scatters uh, go into resonance with that wavelength. So that's why it's uh, selected, not necessarily at X-band or some other frequency. And when the incident 
electromagnetic wave hits upon such a scatterer, then we, we have three phenomena that could occur. We could have scattering. That's when the electromagnetic radiation uh, diffuses uh, uniformly in a, in a sphere type shape, uh, which is, we call it isotropic. We have the absorption whereby some of the electromagnetic radiation can be absorbed by that particle or uh, backscatter, and that's what we're interested in. So we're interested in the way that um, we'd like to illuminate the atmosphere. We'd like to do it in a way that uh, we can penetrate a large volume of it, i.e. Uh, very little absorption, and then get back a reasonable amount of backscatter. And the S-band lets us do that. And so just in brief, uh, in, the, in the Rayleigh region, the expected backscatter per unit volume is given by this expression, whereby this variable eta is known as the reflectivity. And nd is, is the particle size distribution, and sigma sub b is the backscatter uh, cross-section. And so um, these are some of the important terms that you'll see throughout the rest of this discussion. So it turns out that uh, electromagnetic radiation, as it travels through the atmosphere, can travel um, a variety of ways. One way it can travel is via what we call, um, say, vertically polarized or horizontally polarized or um, circularly or with some arbitrary polarization state. Uh, to date, and up until recently, most weather radars have been uh, uh, singularly polarized. However, as of um, about five years ago, when the national grid of WSR88Ds uh, underwent their dual pole upgrade, um, and since then they've been dual pole, that is both uh, vertical and horizontal uh, polarization state. And so a few definitions as we go along. So here I have uh, this uh, electromagnetic waveform here that's traveling in this direction. And we, we can say that the trace of the tip of the electric field is a straight line. In this case, as the electric field uh, traverses, if we trace the tip, then we get um, this particular straight line that uh, it goes up and it goes down and back and back and forth. And so that will be very uh, important as the discussion goes on. Alternatively, we can have waveforms that are horizontally polarized. And so why would we do this? So it turns out the holy grail of um, a weather radar is not only to determine uh, yes, is it raining? Yes, is, uh, hail, are hailstones falling? Is it snowing? Et cetera. But <clears throat> to really be able to discriminate the shape of that object and dual polarized or polarimetric radars can help us do that. So it turns out as raindrops fall through the sky, they tend to flatten out as a pancake type structure. And then the idea is that if you can uh, they, they tend to flatten out as a pancake type structure if, if they're very large. So for small raindrops that fall through the sky, uh, they continue to stay fairly round like a BB, and there's very little uh, polarimetric information in that. But as they become larger, then uh, they flatten out, and you get a lot more uh, res return on the horizontal channel of a polarimetric radar. Now, kind of on the other hand, uh, you may have heard of the notion of circularly polarized radars, whereby, uh, again, following the tip of the electric field vector, actually that tip uh, goes around in a circle, either vertically, either clockwise or counterclockwise. And so um, some people have really taken advantage of uh, circularly polarized waveforms to uh, actually cancel out clutter or 
rainfall, as we'll see in the next few slides. And, and so it turns out that uh, the polarization state can also become more arbitrary. Here I show a state that's uh, more elliptically shaped. And so let's, let's go over a few uh, general cases of uh, polarization. So I begin with this notion of a coherency vector written as J uh, given by uh, the uh, Kronecker product between uh, the two electric fields as I've given there, and then a uh, transform given by M, which I've written here, which allows us to write uh, the, the cl classical uh, Stokes uh, parametric parameters that would describe uh, the polarization state as I've given by this expression here and by the variables uh, G0, G1, G2, G3. And so hold that thought in your mind just a minute because uh, you know, if you're kind of like me, I'm, I'm kind of more of a visual learner. So the question is, how do you, how do you map out this information in a way that's uh, pictorial? And uh, we can do that by the notion of uh, a uh, Poincaré spear, as I'll show in a moment. And so if I take those three variables, or four variables, and then map them out on this uh, XYZ plane, then I can arrive at uh, this kind of structure. If I draw a sphere around it, I arrive at this, whereby uh, the length of this vector here uh, that I've drawn in red is always constant. And so it, it's known that such a sphere is a, is a well-established way to, to understand what polarization state that you're in. So depending on where that vector lies, you can be uh, vertically polarized, horizontally polarized. You can be what we call uh, slant 45, which is what we commonly use uh, for fully polarimetric weather radars, or right and left hand <coughs> circularly polarized. And so here I just show a few details about, you know, if you're the very top of the sphere, you're on uh, left hand. If you're at the very bottom of the sphere, you're on right hand. And so you can gain an understanding of what polarization state that you're in. And so you may also wonder about um, your, your polarization efficiency. And here we look at it in terms of a ratio. And uh, this is the classical definition that is given by uh, the IEEE. And so with that, we can start to gain an understanding of, you know, if I, if I transmit on vertical and receive on vertical, I should have an efficiency of, of unity, which is what you'd expect. If I transmit on vertical and receive on slant 45 or uh, slant 135, which is just 90 degrees uh, tilted over, then I have an efficiency of about um, minus 3 dBs, for instance. And naturally, you'd expect if I transmit vertically and attempt to uh, receive horizontally, I would get an efficiency of, of zero. And so it turns out you can look at all of these properties and you can see some other interesting features. Uh, here we've got transmit circular, say, right-hand polarization. And then if I attempt to receive left-hand polarization, I get out an efficiency of uh, zero. And so uh, there in Oklahoma, uh, at the National Weather Radar Testbed that was operational between 2003 and 2016, uh, we had on loan uh, from us, uh, from the Navy, a uh, SPY-1 S-band weather radar that operated at 3,200 megahertz or 3.2 gigahertz. And this is a picture of it uh, mounted up on our North Campus in partnership with our NOAA partners. And sure enough, you can see that if you transmit on uh, uh, vertical and receive on vertical, you get this ideal beam shape. However, if you transmit, for instance, uh, horizontally and receive on vertical, then you get, you know, not theoretically zero, but 
um, you know, a good 50 dB down from what you expected. And so if we look around the nation at the kinds of radars that are polarimetric and the kinds that aren't, uh, we, see, we see some of this. So we see the FAA's terminal Doppler weather radar. Uh, they're linear horizontal, which kind of makes sense. So the terminal Doppler weather radar, what it tries to do is it operates in the airport terminal areas. There are only 40 to 45 such radars throughout the nation that uh, are in existence and typically at the larger airports. And so uh, they're horizontally polarized so that they can try to find out or try to discriminate, say, uh, small raindrops versus larger ones based on the, this elliptical uh, size that gets generated as the larger raindrops uh, fall. Now, <clears throat> other radars, for instance, the airport surveillance radars, ASRs, say 9 and 4, you'll notice that they support linear polarization and circular polarization. They support circular polarization because uh, these terminal or these particular radars, they're looking for uh, aircraft in the uh, uh, vicinity that are, that are moving and they really don't want to be uh, impacted by rainfall impacts. So during the light rain cases, when they transmit, say, circular uh, left hand, when that circularly polarized waveform strikes a uh, perfectly round uh, hydrometer or scatterer, it will uh, return to the radar in the op opposite uh, circular polarization case. So if you're transmitting on uh, left hand, strikes an object, returns on the right hand, since we know that the polarization efficiency is zero at that case, then uh, that particular paradigm tends to act as a, uh, a way to remove those uh, rain rainfall impact clutters to the radar. Thus, uh, you can see the, uh, the, the aircraft returns with uh, less clutter from the, from the rain. <clears throat> so that's a great thing. And then, as I mentioned a minute ago, NOAA's weather uh, surveillance radars WSR, uh, model 1988, and D for Doppler, they support simultaneous H and V. So they're dual polarized. So let's take a look at some more uh, scattering types of discussions. And uh, with respect to this, here I define some of these uh, parameters. Uh, lambda is a wavelength. I define these particular parameters. I've got uh, D min, D max, talking about the di diameter of a particle, and then uh, I kind of move on forward. And then I mentioned the topic of the uh, drop size distribution in D. So if we look at this, um, in D, which is, uh, helps us determine, you know, the, the, the drop size distribution of, of the particles, we can look at, uh, various drop sizes, for instance, as a function of their uh, diameter in millimeters, as I've got written here. It turns out that uh, there are many models or many competing models for who may have the best drop size distribution. And so I've given a variety of models that may exist, but, but generally the, the structure of the model tends to have this particular shape uh, where this is the distribution along this axis and this is the size in millimeter along that axis. Uh, turns out that dual polarized weather radars tend to uh, occupy this uh, sort of exponential model as I've written there. So if we look around at, in some of the literature, uh, other people have come up with a variety of drop size distributions that uh, model what the uh, uh, scatterers may look like. So I've got some examples there. And so here I've got some examples of, for instance, here's KOUN, and here I've got uh, this, this notion of reflectivity drawn by uh, this axis here, and I've got the radar shown in green and a 
distrometer is a device that um, is used for ground truth that relies on uh, optical imagery to really uh, capture uh, a notion of the, the true drop size distribution. And so uh, here I can just show you some, some uh, agreement between, say, how a radar works and a distrometer would work. So that allows us uh, the calculation of the reflectivity factor based on the variables that I showed a moment ago, uh, differential reflectivity, and uh, what we'll call the copolarization correlation coefficient, the specific differential phase and differential phase. And so if we take all that information and we try to understand how a radar works. <clears throat> so the way it works out is that a radar sends out uh, pulses into the atmosphere and then waits for the received echoes. And when it does that, we would send out a pulse one, pulse two, pulse three, and so on and so forth. And for every what we call range gate, we integrate the uh, output of all of the pulses. And so um, that's how that is. And the data, since the radar is uh, what we call coherent, that is the uh, transmitter and the receiver are both of their oscillators are locked in phase, we get returns that are coherent. In other words, they're, uh, we get the I and Q data. And then from that, for every range gate, I can calculate a spectrum. I can calculate a reflectivity factor, a radial velocity or spectrum width, or these other um, parameters that I showed a moment ago. And as the radar typically looks in a circular fashion, then I can trace out you know, a 360 degree volume of the atmosphere. And so let's take a look at some particular case. So <clears throat> here we have a famous tornado case that occurred in Moore, Oklahoma in 2013. Uh, here we have um, a picture of the reflectivity factor uh, pictured here. This was uh, data was captured uh, via our partners at the Advanced Radar Research Center. So uh, our partner, uh, Boon Ling Chong, led this experiment. So it turns out that we had our radar parked approximately right about right about in through right about in through here, and we're able to capture this storm as this EF5 tornado moved through Moore, Oklahoma. And so uh, when we did that, we're able to, to look at, again, here I show the reflectivity. Here I show the, what we'll call the differential reflectivity. So here we're looking at um, the difference in, say, the H and the V return. So it's the ratio of uh, Z horizontal with respect to Z vertical. So if, if something is purely spherical, such as a, a BB falling through the sky, we would expect zero dBs. But however, as large, large raindrops fall through the sky, uh, they tend to flatten out as a pancake, like I mentioned earlier. And when that occurs, uh, this ratio is larger than zero uh, dB. And so you can see this part of the storm structure here, which is what we call the classic hook echo, it tends to have a lot of uh, high differential reflectivity, for instance, right around and through here. And, and that, that's where the raindrops are, are, are really large at that time. So I can look at some of the other variables uh, that I mentioned a minute ago. I, we can look at the radial velocity. So a tornado is a something that you would expect since you know it's rotating in a circle, if you look at two adjacent range gates, you'd expect one range gate to have a very, very high inbound velocity, and we denote those with green colors, and one range gate to have a very, very, very high outbound velocity. We denote those with red colors. So, you know, right around, right around and through here, we can detect a very 
small couplet of very strong green adjacent to very strong red. So we know that there's a circular rotation there. Um, some other variables of interest, um, spectrum width not used too often. Um, this is very interesting. This, this row, HD, you can kind of see here, um, it's conditioned based on the water content <clears throat> of the scatterer. So it turns out that right at the, uh, at this point here in the storm, this is where the, this is what they call the classic hook echo, and this, the tornado is right there moving in this direction. It, it has a lot of shingles and uh, house particles in there. Those don't have very much water. So that's why uh, this particular return is relatively strong. So um, very interesting how that is. So let's look now at some of the, yeah, question. What sort of warnings do people get? Um, is this, what kind of warning is good and theoretically possible based on this event? Um, I, I'm, okay, so the question is, what kind of warning did the people get and what kind of, uh, how much lead time? So, as an engineer, I don't, I don't know the forecast for that day, but um, I would have to believe that there was some notion of tornadic activity that could occur somewhere in the state. Pinpointing that, I'm not sure. Um, but an EF5 is the world's like, largest tornado possible. So uh, I, I would have to think that the people of Moore kn knew that the tornado would be imminent at least 20 or 30 minutes out. I don't want to say the wrong thing because I'm not an expert on that, but, um, but I do know that people were taking cover uh, dramatically. I have another question on the yeah, yeah, qu yeah, question? Yeah, on the slide you just had up. So, so you mentioned spectrum width break. What does that exactly measure up? Because I'm imagining you're saying out fairly narrow bands of radiation during getting back to return from that. Is that Oh, oh. Does that wind up corresponding to like the spread of velocities in the area? Yeah, yeah, or? it does, it does. So he's asking about the spectrum width and what, what does that mean? So a, min, a minute ago when I said, hey, we will send out a pulse, wait for the received echo, send out a pulse. So we typically try to integrate a number of pulses per range gate, let's say 256. So the number of 256 is pretty handy because I can easily calculate the FFT of that and determine the spectrum width. Turns out for tornadic type structures, the spectrum width is rather large and flat across the top. In other words, all radial velocity components are very well represented in there. Um, that's how that is. So let's look at some of the electronics for dual pole uh, phase ray radars. And so there are three different types of modes, um, alternating transmit and alternating receive, alternating transmit and simultaneous receive, and simultaneous transmit and simultaneous receive. So here are some, here are some electronics that describe those modes. And so uh, alternating transmit and alternating receive means, hey, I'd like to transmit on H, Receive on H, and transmit on V, receive on V, and this ping pong approach all the way, all the way uh, forward. And I do that with uh, typically uh, some switches that help me achieve that. Some people don't like it because it takes a long time to get through the timeline. Another approach is, well, hey, I'd like to alternatively switch or transmit on H and V and just receive simultaneously on both H and V. So in other words, I'd transmit on H, receive on H and V, and then transmit on V, and then receive on both. Uh, some people have done that. Um, depending on where you stand and what your requirements are, uh, some people don't like it because it takes a longer scan time, and um, it's not the most accurate way to arrive at the full um, scattering matrix. Uh, the best, which is yet unfortunately the most expensive, 
is to transmit both on H and V simultaneously and receive on both as well. And so let's take a look at some examples of radars that do this. Um, this is an older radar that we had in Oklahoma uh, before it got zapped by a severe lightning storm. And so it's polarimetric in nature and it supports um, simultaneous receive and simultaneous, or simultaneous transmit and simultaneous receive. Very similar to the way that the dual pole uh, 88D works. So here I took a picture of what they call the um, OMT of this guy. And basically it's, it's uh, pretty easy to understand. You have uh, two pieces of waveguide that feed into a common transmit tube and you transmit on both H and V and you receive on both H and V. And so, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, when you do this, you can get out a variety of, uh, uh, of these polarimetric uh, variables. Uh, you get the reflectivity, you get the differential reflectivity, you get out some notion of the correlation coefficient and the differential phase. And so, with all these variables, what would I do with all this? And so, um, it turns out, that there's a particular case whereby we've got this radar that um, is studying this, a very, very strong storm that is going by. So it turns out you can take all of these uh, polarimetric parameters and put them into a hydrological, um, let's, um, clustering algorithm. That, that allows you to figure out or learn what, what is rain or hail, what is heavy rain, what is light rain, what is grapple, this kind of frozen state in between hailstones and, and raindrops, what is ice crystals, what's wet snow, dry snow, what is biological scatters, for instance, you may have birds flying around, <clears throat> insects, et cetera. And so this, this hydrological classification algorithm lets you really discriminate what it is that the radar is illuminating. So it turns out for this very strong storm that is going by, uh, here we see what the HCA gives us. So along here, we have very, very heavy rain. Along here, can you guess? Can you guess what this is? It's not raining here, but what is this? Nope, it's birds and bugs flying up out of the treetops because they know it's about to rain very dramatically upon them. So they are jumping up out of the trees. They're flying away. So it's just very interesting to me that you know the the. Wildlife seems to know more than humanity about, hey, there's a storm coming. So within a global context, um, this is where the world is going. Across the uh, United States, uh, we have many people working on polarimetric radars, Canada, Australia, uh, Europe is very interested, Asia, and et cetera. So, um, you, you know, this is a body of research that's going on throughout the entire world. Um, here I show an example of a weather radar we put together in our group. Uh, I give a lot of credit to my teammates that uh, put this together. So it's a uh, polarimetric radar whereby um, we're able to support an independent um, transmitter on the H channel and an independent transmitter on the V channel and uh, each transmitter is a 100 watt solid state high powered amplifier. So it's, a, it's pretty sporty. You know, it's not a tube or a klystron or um, one of these other types of amplifiers that you may be aware of. For instance, your microwave oven at home has a magnetron, right? 
dirt cheap, but terrible in terms of, you know, it has random startup phase on each pulse, if you will. Um, but they, those put out like 1,000 watts or 1,200 watts. But to get a really high fidelity amplifier um, that would support, you know, the coherent uh, transmit and receive, one of these solid state HPAs is the way to go. And we had one on each of uh, the transmitter, uh, H and V. And so, so you may think to yourself, well, in terms of next generation weather radar, well, hey, I'd like to get away from tubes, you know, klystrons, magnetrons, all of this kind of stuff. I'd like to get away with that or, get, you know, re remove myself from that and go with these solid state devices. But it turns out that still these solid state devices are fairly low power. So in order to um, eliminate that, you might think to yourself, well, hey, well, I'll just extend the length of my transmit pulse, right? You may think that, so that I'll have more power on the target. But, but just as soon as you do that, you ex extend the length, then you, um, you give up what you call your, your range resolution. So one way to rectify that is to go with a, a linear FM chirp um, so that you can get a sufficient amount of power onto the target all the while uh, sufficient bandwidth and hence range resolution. So here I show some deployments of this radar uh, around the world. And so this is kind of a system block diagram of what it looks like. So we've got, here we've got the, uh, the intelligence of the unit. We've got the digital electronics for the uh, waveform generator and receiver. Uh, upon transmit, I send out a small signal. I upconvert it, upconvert it, goes to the H HPA, goes out. Um, leaves the antenna, and then also what I do is I take a small snapshot of that transmitted pulse so that I can use that inside of what we call pulse compressor, in other words, matched filter for my transmitted waveform. So now I've got a copy of it, and then on receive, I kind of do the opposite. In receive mode, I've got the instant RF uh, energy comes back, goes to this down converter and then to the receiver. And then I what we call pulse compress or matched filter against the transmitted pulse I just sent out. And so this is, this is what I get. Um, here we have a very strong storm going by the radar. The radar is located right in the center of the, the circle here, but you can kind of tell the problem here is that, <clears throat> you know, once the pulse is being turned on, for instance, for a rather long time, I get a very long blind range for the, for the radar because I can't simultaneously transmit and receive. However, um, turns out if we time domain multiplex a very short unmodulated pulse with the uh, LFM that's going out, I can recover all of this region that is in a very close region to the uh, radar itself. And uh, this is what that looks like uh, in terms of uh, a waveform. So here I've got what we call a linear FM. Starts out at a low frequency and then hops to a high frequency. And then right at the very tail end, I've got a very, very small unmodulated pulse. I send it out so I can recover all of that area in a very close proximity to the uh, to the radar. Yep. Yep. That. Which line is that? From a little bit below where you're pointing, sort of like a uh, almost like a tail that's running through the end. lower left. Oh, is it that? That? Okay, what is that? Well, that's a squall line. It's a small. Er, so the question is, what is this uh, very intense line that's moving? 
So that is what we call a squall line. It's a very, very uh, intense band of rainfall. So I think you have them here in New England uh, fairly every once in a while, I know. In Oklahoma, we have a lot of what we call convective weather. Convective weather means um, we have a lot of, for instance, cold wind off of Colorado, a lot of warm Gulf moisture coming up from southern Texas, and then right in the center part of the United States, we have a lot of these um, very strong storms with uh, very, uh, uh, very large raindrops and, and hail and uh, lightning. You have some of that here, mostly in New England. I think you have what we call a lot of stratiform rain. Stratiform rain is just a light rain that just tends to fall out of the sky, very, very small raindrops. It's uh, not too exciting, but it is what it is. <laughs> okay, yeah, great question. And so, you know, we have a long waveform, short pulse, then we switch to receive and we see what we get. So I mentioned a minute ago about uh, bandwidth and things of that nature. So you may know that your conventional uh, linear FM uh, is possible. You increase the bandwidth. However, you may wish to reduce the uh, what we call the range side lobes. So you can do that with what we call a nonlinear FM signal, where the rate of frequency change is not uniform throughout the entire pulse. And we do that so we can reduce the uh, range side lobes. So uh, here I give a lot of credit to uh, uh, Jim Curdzo. You may know him. He's at the Lincoln Lab now. He was at OU for a long time. Uh, that's, that's where he graduated. But anyhow, um, he worked on some waveform optimization whereby, well, you know, we begin with a textbook quality waveform, and then we put that through the solid state power amplifier and the associated RF electronics. And what, what emanates or what is getting radiated to the atmosphere may not be this uh, perfect waveform as we had hoped. But his question was, or point of curiosity was, how can I correct both in amplitude and phase that waveform? In other words, uh, today a lot of people call this digital pre-distortion. How can you correct for that <clears throat> so that that radiated waveform is, is perfect when it goes out? And here I show uh, what, what he's talking about there. So this is, this is his uh, measured output af after all the RF electronics. And then um, he goes into a, an approach to correct for that. And uh, when he does that, he's able to show that you know, from a textbook quality point of view, uh, in this particular incarnation, his range side lobes are down by about 59 dB. Uh, after he takes his textbook quality waveform and uh, impresses upon the electronics, uh, he, he arrives at, you know, almost 20 dBs less, which is uh, completely not good. But after his optimization procedure, you know, he recovers, you know, 10 more dB. So, uh, that's, that's a good thing. So, we're back to this again. So this shows the storm that we talked about a minute ago, and the radar is right there. And here's this hook echo. You know, now it even looks like a hook. And it's moving, you know, from southwest to, to northeast. And, you know, this is, this is more Oklahoma and through here, here's more Oklahoma. You know, this is what we call Newcastle. And, you know, my house is like right there. <laughs> it's like eight or nine miles due south. So uh, that's very close to my house. Uh, but this is the storm. And uh, this radar, uh, you know, from our group captured, captured that storm. So turns out, you may wonder, hey, I, you, you begin to have an understanding of the storm, but you may wonder, you know, what, what are these things here? Anybody know? These little point targets kind of zipping about? 
close, news helicopters. <laughs> those, I mean, these people are crazy. I mean, because the inflow of the storm is sucking in a lot of uh, things, and uh, these news helicopters, you know, they're they're just they're going crazy. I I just couldn't believe it. So, but as an engineer, you know, hey, I'm very curious about um, what what that looks like. <laughs> so I I get the data. You know, I zoom in on what we call a range gate. And I look at the polarimetric return, uh, H and V, of what a helicopter looks like. And sure enough, you know, you get quite a bit of um, uh, differential uh, reflectivity out of that thing, right? So you can, you can use the differential reflectivity to help you discriminate. So you get, here I get, you know, quite a bit more V return than H for some certain number of pulses. So again, uh, you, I think Daniel, you're asking about the number of pulses. So here we're, you know, we're trying to integrate upwards of about 400 pulses. Pardon? Oh, uh, so the, so we have a question asking about artificial intelligence. So I think um, this is just ripe for that kind of study. So. Um, so a research partner of mine and I, we, we from about 03, 04 to about 06, 07 looked at uh, using artificial intelligence neural networks to identify tornadoes uh, within the vicinity of a certain um, large radar on campus. Uh, unfortunately, during that three-year period of time, only one or two radar, uh, tornadoes came by it. So we didn't have enough cases to really exercise it. But I kind of believe now with more mobile radars, uh, just more radars in general, uh, high density of radars, uh, you can ingest more and more data and really start to use uh, neural networks and uh, things like that to... Uh, Uh, I know you can get data off of the, it used to be called the NCDC, the National Center for Climactic Data. It's all, all of this is available. Yeah, it'd be interesting. Yeah, question. It would also, it would also be interesting to look for little blips like that and try it for late night. Or track tracking signals. Uh, you could. Okay, so now I'd like to talk about multi-mission phased array. So we've talked about, you know, weather radars that are predominantly dish-style radars. We've talked about singularly polarized radars. We've talked about dual polarized radars. We've talked about WSR-88Ds. We've talked about TDWRs, ASRs. We've talked about a lot of radars. And so, uh, in the past, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, this notion of the multi-mission phased array radar. Uh, historically known as the MPAR initiative, then later known as Sensor. And so, uh, turns out throughout the nation, we have about a little over 500 of these disparate type of radars. And the question is, how can we have one radar that would replace all these older mechanically rotating pieces of equipment <clears throat> with, with one phased array. So um, that's, that's the question of, of, of MPAR. And so here I cite some of the work by the Lincoln Lab people. And uh, Dave Conway's worked on <clears throat> this, uh, you know, Mark Weber, Jeff Hurd, et cetera, and many other people. And so they've worked on this panelized type approach over the years to help us, you know, help, help the nation try to arrive at that. And so this is kind of uh, the genesis of that. And over time, this is uh, what they have out in Norman at the current time. So here they've got 76 panels um, mounted onto a rotating platform for weather observations. And here's some of their 
some of their results with um, a WSR88D radar known as uh, KTLX. So their results are pretty good. And so, so now I'd like to talk a little bit about um, beamforming and phased array weather radar. So here's, here's our campus in the background. Um, here's this uh, NOAA's experimental uh, radar. It's, it's an S-band radar known as KOUN. And for the work that I'm talking about in the next few minutes, uh, we did have an S-band uh, phased array uh, under this blue dome. And so, differing from a mechanical rotating dish style um, dish radar, we have phased arrays. And the beauty of a phased array is that we can implement digital beamforming. So with, a, with beamforming, we like to do two things. A, steer a beam or beams in certain locations and steer nulls towards unwanted signals, particularly ground clutter, uh, clutter generated by buildings, et cetera, or interference that may be popping up out in the far field. And so we typically do this via a variety of algorithms. So here I show uh, gradient descent algorithms, LMS, RLS, uh, two very efficient but not very robust algorithms versus uh, standard statistical approaches. And so here I've got, you know, the statistically optimum approaches that are, uh, de de depend on the data that's incoming uh, itself. And so now I show uh, two examples of such algorithm, or of these kinds of algorithms. One, on the National Weather Radar Testbed, that was operational a few years ago, and on this radar that we call the Atmospheric Imaging Radar. <clears throat> and so, as I mentioned a minute ago, we had on loan for a number of years uh, this large S-band phased array in Norman uh, from the Navy, and we partnered with uh, quite a few groups to make it happen. Um, so when we got the radar in 03, uh, it was instrumented with its some beam only so that it could mimic the very close by um, KOUN weather radar that's right there. So both of these are S-band, so we could make you know, easy comparisons of the reflectivity data. However, we didn't get this radar instrumented with the what we call the side lobe cancellation channels. And so that's a project um, that I worked on and with, with partners, of course. And uh, it was funded by the National Science Foundation to open up the slide lobe cancellation channels. And so we built RF down converter circuitry, et cetera, uh, installed the digital receivers. This is on the back side of the array. This is what the uh, receiver cabinet looked like and so forth. <clears throat> and so here we'd like to mitigate uh, ground clutter on or, or from the... Uh, uh, from, the, from the radar returns. And so here I show why would we like to implement side lobe cancellation. So it turns out that we oftentimes like to implement an architecture known as beam multiplexing where we transmit um, a few pulses in one direction, hop to another, transmit a couple more, and then continue back and forth so that we can arrive at statistically independent samples and a small number of pulses just in general. So we'd like to uh, implement these ground clutter or ground clutter cancellation with a small number of pulses rather than, for instance, uh, a, a large number of pulses that um, your typical, say, dish style radar uses. And so let's take a look at how this might look like. So here we have these six side lobe cancellation channels uh, around the periphery, the periphery of this array. And if I look at um, what we call the 
the beam patterns of the sunbeam. You can see here in blue, I've got the sunbeam drawn. And then in red, I've got uh, the side lobe cancellation pattern drawn. You can see that the side lobe cancelers, since they're very, very few relative to what makes up the sunbeam, you know, the, the amount of gain there is significantly less than uh, the main beam. But however, since um, there are a few of them, their, you know, their, their side lobe contribution is rather, rather tall. So luckily, what's in the side lobes of the clutter cancel of the of the side lobe cancelers is about equal to what's in the side lobes of the sunbeam. So in the way that that is, we can basically, you know, subtract out the clutter that's found in the side lobe cancelers from the main beam return. And how would it look like? So we looked at a variety of algorithms. Um, here I point out, point out my partners, uh, Chris Curtis and John Lake. Um, so we looked at very particularly this thing called linearly constrained minimum power, LCMP. And so I just go through the mathematics pretty quickly, whereby uh, I start forming up um, uh, vectors, matrices, start computing a notion of a, a power in each range gate, and then I can calculate, I can look at the uh, average power through this calculation here, and then I can arrive at S, which is the autocorrelation matrix, and then I can create some constraints and then kind of working through quickly. And so then the LCMP algorithm works to minimize this expression subject to that constraint. Uh, it's a very well-known type of approach. And so turns out I can set up a cost function that looks like this. Um, you probably recognize this. I can just take pretty easily the gradient of this, set it equal to zero, solve out for the weights, and you know I can arrive at this kind of closed form expression. And so I may wish to uh, impose some diagonal loading to prevent um, any kinds of singularities in the uh, inverse matrix calculation, and so on and so forth. And so if I look at some of the results on, on simulated data, we arrive at this. So you can see that um, here I've got zero. This is zero velocity. Uh, this would be stationary clutter sorts of things. And out here, this is, this is the signal that I'm really interested in. This is, this is where the weather is. So you can see, um, you can see that the weighted sum which is in the, in the red there, um, for any ground clutter that would have been in there, it is effectively um, greatly attenuated, as you can see, relative to the, to the blue. And so if we look at this on weather data, we get out uh, quite a bit more improvement. Here we have kind of another, <clears throat> another incarnation of this, whereby you can see that, again, rather than receiving a very, very large return at, at zero velocity, meaning ground clutter, we effectively uh, can take that out. So, you know, side lobe cancellation is possible for weather surveillance. That's why uh, phased arrays are we believe better for uh, the, the weather mode as opposed to a dish. Uh, you know, you've got base arrays have more channels so that adaptive beam forming is more practical and so forth. And then we found that the accurate uh, covariance matrix measurement is important. <clears throat> so now I look at this other radar known as the atmospheric imaging radar. It was operational, operational our group from uh, 2008 to just until last year. So the idea there is, well, 
can we transmit a very uh, spoiled beam that's shown in green here, whereby it's about 25 degrees tall in as, uh, 20, er, in, in elevation, and about one degree wide in, uh, in as, in azimuth. And so I've got that shown in green here. So the question is, on receive, can we digitally beamform in a way that we can form multiple, multiple simultaneous beams, as you can see here in red? So uh, that's what we did. So on transmit, we've got a uh, slotted waveguide at the top of this structure here that, that sends out a pulse that's about 25 by 1 at 9.55 gigahertz, that's X-band. And then on receive, we've got 36 independent receive subarrays in this dimension here. This is kind of the backside of, of this array. Again, here we've got our transmitter, and then we've got these slat antennas that are about two meters in this dimension, and they're about probably three or four inches tall. This is what they look like. <clears throat> so this depicts a little bit of the uh, digital receiver incarnation, whereby we've got uh, an octal eight channel analog to digital converter, which then feeds into this uh, FPGA fabric, whereby uh, we digitally down convert all the way down to the INQ signals. So this is a kind of a depiction of what these digital receivers look like. So on receive, uh, you might ask, well then what? So then we'd like to beamform on receive. So the simplest beamformer is to implement uh, Fourier transform on receive data. And just in brief, I show these mathematics. Uh, it's pretty simple to implement, but uh, not so great uh, side lobes. So we look at other types of ways to beamform. Another way is known as uh, capon beamforming, whereby uh, it's a, what we call minimum variance distortionless response type beamformer. And uh, it minimizes the power everywhere except for the look direction. That's its main uh, claim. However, there are other approaches known as uh, robust capon beamforming uh, generated by some people, uh, Lee and Stoysha, in 2003, which is better than the classic capon beamforming because you have a little bit of control over just how sensitive the algorithm is, and we found this to be uh, really helpful. So in brief, I show uh, the algorithm that we used to, to achieve that. And so here are some of our results. So here we've got uh, our, our radar aperture here, and on the balcony of this building, we've got, uh, got a couple of transmitters, you know, transmitting, and then we're, and then we're receiving. So with Fourier beamforming, you can see, you know, we can fairly, fairly well discriminate those two transmitters, but again, you know, the, the side lobes are rather tall, so it doesn't offer much uh, discrimination. The typical capon beamformer is shown here, and then the robust uh, capon beamformer here, uh, beamformer is shown here uh, under the notion that epsilon is, is unity. And if I <clears throat> increase epsilon, you can see that the algorithm does a really good job of you know, reducing the side lobe structure as I wanted and being reasonably uh, sensitive to the two objects that I'm searching for. However, if I continue to increase, um, you know, the algorithm is, isn't sensitive enough and then allows uh, too many of the uh, side lobe structures to dominate. So if I put it all together, 
and continue to look at various storms. Here's some storm data that was collected by uh, uh, the KOUN, and here I'm showing, or sorry, this is KTLX, which is there in the Oklahoma City area, and then I'm looking at kind of this slice of the storm along that radial, and, and I next do this with the uh, atmospheric imaging radar. So you can see that of the three examples, here's the windowed Fourier beam forming uh, shown here, KPON, and then the robust KPON beam former. So it does a, a really pretty good job of um, accurately estimating, you know, the reflectivity of the storm all the while, since I mentioned a minute ago, we don't want too high of side lobes. So you can see it doesn't grab too much ground clutter as the, say, the Fourier approach would work. So here are a few more examples of uh, what this may look like. And a few more examples of, you know, this is what we call RHI, that's range height indicator. So I'm looking at a vertical slice of the atmosphere. And, and the beauty of this particular radar, since it's an imaging radar, allows us a very quick 3D imaging of the entire atmosphere. And if I put together all of the results and begin to scan storms, then you can see uh, this is what we get. So this is the world's highest resolution, both spatially and temporally, uh, snapshot of a uh, tornado. And, and you can see that you, not only do you see this kind of classic hook echo forming on the ground, but you can see this really interesting uh, up, updraft structure, the inner structure of the storm itself. So um, I still think we're a few decades away from really understanding uh, tornado genesis and, and being able to really understand and even try to be even to predict um, well, well in advance these kinds of storms. So, so if we look around the nation, here's another kind of cylindrical array. Um, I give credit to my partners here, Caleb Fulton, and uh, this team here, and uh, Guifu Zhang, um, and, and his NOAA partners for this kind of uh, structure. So here we have this notion of a cylindrical array, and what we have here is we're trying to answer the question, for a phased array, we know that for a flat panel, whenever we are, you know, looking along the bore site, we can get this exquisite, what we call cross-pole isolation. But if we steer off bore site, then we, we lose that, and we need to recalibrate for that. But however, for, for a cylindrical array, um, you don't necessarily ever steer off bore site because your, your, your look angle is always normal to the surface. So you only need to calibrate once, and that's good for everywhere you look. And basically, you just then commutate a 90 degree wedge around the periphery, and you can create surveillance. And so, uh, we've looked at this. It's, this particular array is uh, two meters tall and two meters in diameter with 192 um, S-band uh, columns. Each column has a number of patches on it, uh, two meters in length. Uh, here we show a little bit of the uh, electronics, uh, RF up-down converter circuitry. Uh, here we show uh, again, some of the RF circuits, and we're using uh, these 80 watt uh, GAN, GAN uh, HPAs. So, in the way that that is, we are relying again on uh, pulse compression. Uh, here we show some of the uh, first generation uh, digital uh, transmit and receive electronics shown there. Here we show 
some of the uh, calibration work, I give credit to uh, Caleb Fulton and all of the engineers for figuring out how to put this thing in calibration and more importantly, um, create the algorithm for the digital beamformer. So the standard, we know the standard linear array has range side lobes of about minus 13.1 dB. Uh, if you look at all the math for a cylindrical array, it has uh, side lobes down by about 8 dB. So that requires a lot of uh, uh, digital beamforming to uh, kick down the range side, or the, the side lobes, uh, as done there. Here's a little bit more of this uh, calibration work. You can kind of see also that uh, uh, the cross pole isolation here is, uh, you know, minus, you know, good minus 35 dB, 36, 37 there. And again, over here, uh, fairly low. Here's some results for looking at uh, a radar known as uh, KTLX, which is there in the Oklahoma City area versus uh, the returns from CPAR. So the results are uh, fairly similar. This is the differential reflectivity. Uh, here's the current status of the radar. So we uh, put it on top of our building. Uh, this depicts a little bit about, uh, we don't have a storm here present, but it depicts, you know, how we can commutate a sector around the, uh, this 360 degree um, set of elements so that you can achieve, you know, beam steering with no moving uh, mechanical infrastructure, all in a very interesting way. Yeah, question. Is it just your electronics right now that are preventing you from doing this all over 360 degrees simultaneously? Like, why do you, why do you have to scan this? <sighs> okay, so he's asking, is it just the uh, electronics that are presenting, uh, preventing us from uh, simultaneously looking 360 degrees? So that's, that's a pretty good question. Um, so if you look, if you try to look 360 degrees without, say, beam forming in one direction, you'll give up a, a lot of sensitivity. So now you're, you're requesting, you know, transmitting everywhere at once and then trying to receive. So that, that's a pretty tough proposition because it takes a, a giant amount of transmit power. There's that and, um, and it's well known that uh, this kind of structure doesn't very well support multiple simultaneous beams. It's just a known thing. Why, why is that? Um, you, well, if you, if you try to do that, you'll give up a lot of, a tremendous amount of angular resolution in that approach. Two sectors that are just 180 degrees apart. I, I suppose you could. I just haven't. I haven't engaged on that. Then it becomes like a giant, you know, non-trivial software type of uh, incarnation. I, I suppose you could. We just haven't looked at it. So now some conclusions and some food for thought. So, you know, of course I've shown you. Uh, some notions of uh, polarimetric arrays. I've shown you some notions of phased arrays, uh, pulling both uh, polarimetry and phased array into the same uh, paradigm is really the, the future direction of, of where I think the, the, the country and the world and are going in this, this arena. Yeah, question. For simultaneous transmit and receive. Um, okay, the question is 
how do you, on simultaneous transmit, how do you prevent blowing up the LNAs? So let's kind of back up to the simplest approach. So if you've, if you've got, let's suppose you've got waveguide. So you've got H and V coming in at 90 degrees onto a waveguide. Um, it's fairly straightforward to, to treat that as a combiner. Goes in the waveguide, goes out. For H and V on, I mean, what's your question? I mean, it's it's there's there, there's no problem. For overloading, they use phasing for compensate for overloading, like in operational amplifiers, but they use phased, uh, like different wavelengths waveguides. Uh, just, I, I think, elaborating on the previous thing, um, sort of what was puzzling me as well is how do you keep, like, you're putting out hundreds to thousands of watts, right? Is then, how do you keep that from cycling back into sensitive electronics? Because even if you're receiving at the same time, you can, wind, if you have even, like, a few milliwatts getting back in. Uh, no, we, you transmit and then receive. Oh, okay, so it's actually gating it in between. It's gated, right. Okay. It's, it's, one, it's one or the other. Ah. It's correct. It's, yeah, it's, I, yeah it's, it's one or the other. Yeah, question. Um. Yeah, I had also just sort of been wondering about, um, and this was early on looking at the plot. So you've got um, the relative uh, values of what was DBR or something as relative reflections on different polarizations. So I mean, it, it's, I assume that would be like higher for raindrops than for solid objects or? Uh, depends. So you're, you're asking about raindrops, small raindrops, say of, of size one millimeter and smaller, tend to fall out of the sky like a BB. If you illuminate them um, with H and V, you'll get H and V returns in, in those powers of about the same thing. Larger raindrops, um, as they fall out of the sky, tend to flatten out uh, as an ellipsoid, and they will have a larger uh, H return. Okay. So there you can begin to discriminate. Now remember, you know, what's in a range, what's in a range volume is, you know, thousands and thousands and millions of raindrops. So it's a, almost like a statistical measure. You're just getting a, uh, a, a notion of how many dBs more, uh, is something, uh, you know, ellip more ellipsoid than, than not. That's what you get. Now, <clears throat> man-made objects, things that aren't natural, are uh, of a something else, uh, something different. If they're in the, uh, in the optical region, then that's something different. If they're in the Rayleigh region, for instance, uh, I'm not sure what that would be. Something that's, you know, I doubt it, very small. But typically man-made sorts of things have uh, particular corners, uh, creases. Those are known as corner reflectors. And whichever orientation the corner reflector is, that's what you'll tend to see more of on a dual polarized radar. Okay, well, uh, thank you. Thank you. Do we, do we want a buffer hang?